If we suffer for Christ's sake, do we take it as a privilege, as honor? When people want to say, Jesse, you're just a holy roly. Amen. Thank you. Can we do that? Or do we like want to change it because we don't want people to think of us as being holy rollies or whatever they might call them today. I don't know. Can we? Can we be set apart from the people who are lost? At the beginning, at the very beginning of his teaching, I told you all that the book of Colossians was, is going to teach us to separate our, ourselves from the world. So this is not our home. We're just passing through here. Everybody that passes through this time right here, the Lord has given everybody this time right here to make a choice. Do you want to live for Him? Or do you want to live for yourself, the devil, your friends, your family, your church? You got a choice. You can live for any of these. Because living for the Lord is different from this. You can't live for these and live for the Lord. You can't make your friends happy who are lost and make the Lord happy. He said, what does the light have to do with darkness? People who are lost live in darkness. So what does the light have to do with darkness? That's what I'm saying. If you want to be a, a Christian, your light has to shine because that's what the Lord said. How come nobody's noticing the difference between me and those lost people over there? you got to ask yourself that question. We as Christians, we should be ready to suffer prosecution for living for Him. Not being accepted. You see a crowd of people over there, maybe your old friends, but they really don't want you at the party because you're not a partier. You hear me? That's, our, that's the way we, get, we suffer for the Lord. That ain't nothing. Stevens was stoned to death for living for the Lord. Do we have to worry about that? All we have to be worried about is our friends rejecting us. Because now we live for the Lord and not for them. There's a lot of people out there, they're living for their friends. That's who their God is. Because that's who they live for. That's who they live to please. They're pleasing their friends more than the Lord. We need to be like the disciples. We who are Christians, we who are Christians, the Lord never intended our walk to be unbearable, a burden to us. When, the, when your walk with the Lord is being unbearable and it's hard for you to do it, guess what? You're doing it in the flesh and you're not doing it in the spirit. Because when you do it in the spirit, it's a joy. It's a joy to walk with the Lord when you're doing it in the spirit. God told us to what? He told us to hate sin. That's, that's part of being a Christian is hating sin. If you're out there and you don't hate sin, again, question yourself. Question yourself. Am I walking with the Lord? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now listen to this. Who, for the joy that he was set before him, endured the cross. Jesus. Who, for the joy... That was set before him. Talking about Jesus. Endured the cross. Jesus. Knowing he was going to go down the cross. Knowing that he was getting ready to suffer. And go to the cross. He counted it a joy. You know why he counted it a joy? Because he was doing the Father's will. When you're walking with the Lord. And you're in the Father's will. No matter what happens. No matter what happens. We just, we just uh, had a teaching on Job. No matter what happens. Your eyes stay on the Lord. Jesus, right here. He was getting ready to walk through 70 Roman soldiers, the Bible says. 70 Roman soldiers. And to be a Roman soldier, you had to be a big man. Because you had to control crowds. And then the Bible says, 70 Roman soldiers hit him in the face with their fists. And when he came out of it, the Bible says, he didn't even look like a man. That's what Jesus did for us. But mainly, he did it. Because it was God's will for him to do that. Because it was God's will that he, he was going to use his son to reconcile us back to him again. This is how much the father loves you. That he sent his son to suffer that way. So we could have the choice. Do we want to live for the Lord or do we don't? If you do, I'm sending my son. If you go through my son, you're my child. So we have to go through Jesus to get to God. Going to heaven because you just don't want to go to hell? That's not going to last. That's not very strong. When we come to the Lord, we come to the Lord because we know what He's done for us. The grace He's given us. When we deserved absolutely nothing, 
He gave us grace. That's why we come to the Lord, because we love Him. Love and fear, love is forever. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8-9, through 9, We are troubled on every side. Now it's talking about us. Talking about the Christians. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in dis despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. That's what happened to Jesus, ain't it? They spit on him. They did all this stuff to him. But why did he do it? Because at the end, he got the victory. Just like us in here, if we keep our eyes on the Lord, at the end, the Lord is going to reward us by sending us to heaven, by living with him in heaven. It's okay to say amen in here. If anybody wants to say amen, glory to God, anything. Because the word of God should excite you. It should excite you. If you're hearing what the Bible is saying, not what, like I said, Jesse's out of here right now. Jesse's out of here. This is, we're hearing God's words. When you hear God's words, your spirit, I know your spirit's not dead. The Holy Spirit is not dead. The Holy Spirit that is in you wants to get excited because he's hearing, the Holy Spirit is hearing from the Father. So what's the Bible say? Quench not the Holy Spirit. Now there's different kind of, of excitements. You know, you can be like a Pentecost and jump up and down. If you're doing it in the Spirit, nothing wrong with that. If you're doing it in the flesh, you're just being a clown. Or we could be like, like the Baptists. There's Baptists, they move in the Spirit, but they just don't get as, as, as excited as Pentecostals do, okay? But they do. They either have a big smile on their face, or, or they're, you know, there's going to be something there. Christians who are hearing the Word of God, they're not going to sit there like bumps on a log. Alright? Amen. So when I'm reading these words to you, this is the words of God, of God. This is not just a regular book that you get in the library. This book right here is the word of God, the one who created the heavens and the earth. This is the one who is speaking to you. Try to put that in your head. And so when I read the scriptures to you, take it as this is God is talking to me right now. Now I'll be on verse 25. For wherefore I am made a minister. According to the dispensation of God, which given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, this is Paul speaking. Paul saying he's going to fulfill the ministry of the Lord. The one that the Lord has given him to the church with the entire word of God. Verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been laid, which been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Don't you? The Old Testament talks all about Jesus. But people in the Old Testament, they don't see what we see. Because we got the entire Bible now. They didn't have the New Testament. But they had prophecies from the prophets talking about Jesus. Mystery to them. So we have the whole Bible so we can see what the Lord was talking about. And I'll give you an example. In Genesis, in Genesis Chapter 3, verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thee, thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of the woman was who? Jesus. The seed of the woman, it says that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And who is the serpent? The devil. That's what it's saying, that the devil is a serpent. But the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. And who is the seed of the woman? Jesus. So the devil is going to bruise the heel of Jesus. Well, Jesse, how did the devil bruise Jesus' heel? Well, when he was hanging there on the cross, he was hanging on the cross, his arms stretched out. He had to use his heels to push his body up. Because if you don't... if if he, let, if he let his body hang, his chest would, would crush in like that and he couldn't breathe. So he was constantly using his heels to push his body up so he could breathe. And it bruised his heel. We see that. But they didn't know that back then. So these mysteries the Bible talks about, they're no longer mysteries to us. Amen? Amen. So that's, that's an example of verse 27. Now here comes the mystery on, on this verse. Verse 27. To whom God would make known 
What is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory? Paul is saying that the mystery is salvation to the Gentiles. What's Gentile? Gentile is anything other than Jew. You could be Mexican, Chinese, I don't care what you are, you're a Gentile. But because the Jews rejected Jesus, they didn't look at him as being the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, because they rejected him. God said, okay, my word, my salvation is going to go to whoever believes it. And that's how we was able, the Gentiles, that's how we were able to have this salvation over us. Also, because the, Gen the Jews rejected it. Now that, like I said, that's a whole other teaching. I'm not going to get into that. But, but we are Gentiles, and now be, we have salvation. In the Old Testament, it always says that the Messiah would be with you. In the Old Testament. Except where it was prophesied by Ezekiel and Jeremiah, it said the Holy Spirit would be in you. See, in the Old Testament, the Spirit came on you. It didn't, it didn't come in them like it does us today. Because Jesus had to resurrect before the Comforter could come. So before Jesus, the Spirit only came on them. But now after Jesus' resurrection, now the Spirit is in us. You understand that? That's another teaching in its own, but I'm just touching on these because <laughs> I'm teaching this right here. I'm not teaching Holy Spirit and in and out and all that stuff, but which we've had a teaching on the Holy Spirit here already. Now being that like I'm having new people come, maybe I'll do some of these teachings over again. Now verse 28 <clears throat> whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his workings, which worketh in me mightily. All Paul is saying here is that he's working hard. He's working hard at doing God's will. Are we doing the same? Was Paul Jesus... Was he the Messiah? He was a man just like us, right? And if he was a man just like us, and he, if he could do that, then there is, is there any reason why we can't? You know, some people say, well, that was Jesus. He did stuff. That, that was Jesus. No. Even if I use Jesus, when Jesus came on earth, when he came here on earth, he was 100% man. 100%. Now, now we're going to go to chapter 2. I didn't think I'd ever get there, but... Chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at last so does he. and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. What Paul is shown here as a minister is his love for the brothers, for the Christians. That's what, that's what Paul's doing here. He's showing his love to the ministry. Just as the Lord showed his love for us, Paul has shown his love for the brothers and sisters also. And we'll, we'll find out more about that. He gave his life to the brothers for service because of the Lord. Because he wanted to do God's will. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He endureth all things for the elect. Who's the elect? Christians. Mm -hmm. He endureth all things for his brothers. Some people might argue that it's the minist to be a minister, you have to have the qualities to be one. And people seem to think that being intelligent is, a, is a, one of the qualities you have to have. Being intelligent. you got to be educated. You know, if you didn't go to college, then you can't tell me what to do. You can't teach me anything because you didn't go to college. You didn't go to seminaries. Or it's got to be someone who's a good speaker. How many of us know that none of this stuff makes a good minister? These are good things to have. I'm not going to say they're not good to have. But that's not what makes a minister. What makes a minister is someone who loves you as Christ loves you. That, was, that, that is what makes a minister. So these, these men who have these titles before their name and these initials after their name, that means absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. That doesn't impress me. I have to see 
how does he treat the brother? And if I see he treats the brother with love, like Paul, like Christ, that he cares, then I know I'm seeing a minister. Look at Jesus. What was his title? He was a carpenter. My title, Frito Lay. What's this guy going to teach me? He works for Frito. He works for Frito Lay. They wouldn't have accepted Jesus either, because they would have said the same thing. They would have said, "He's just a carpenter." Y'all, y'all hear what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Moses, when God told Moses to go to Pharaoh, the king, Moses told told God, "Lord, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm slow of speech." And believe me, I can understand Moses. Okay, I can understand that. But God used him. Did God use him? Amen. What makes you qualified to do what you're doing? And that's why I made a teaching on it. So I was I showed them through the Word of God what qualifies me to stand up here and teach. I showed them through the Word of God. Hallelujah. I didn't show them, well, the Baptists or the Pentecostals, you gotta go to their college, you gotta go to their seminaries. No. All I need is the Lord. All I need is to have a humble heart to the Lord and read his word. Study his word. And, you know, and that came from the Lord too. Don't think, oh, Jesse, he's... No. That, the Lord gave me that. Because remember this. Even though I'm the one standing up here, I have no good in me, in me without the Lord. I have no good in me without the Lord. Remember that. I'm just a body up here that the, your, the Lord is using the lips. And that's what I pray. Every, every Wednesday I say, Lord, please don't let me say anything that I, that's my opinion. They don't want to hear my opinion. They want to hear from you, Lord. So please fill me with the Holy Spirit and take Jesse out of the picture. And I think he's been doing that. I think he has. Because he, the Lord reveals these scriptures to me and I'm seeing things. He shows me things. I'm like, I'm sorry, but I get more excited in there by myself than, than in it, I in here I do also. But when, I'm first, when the Lord shows me in there while I'm studying, man, I wish y'all were with me in there. You can see the excitement. Like I said, Jesus, he didn't go to Bible college. He didn't go to seminaries. Seminaries, I was told, well, I was told by a pastor. He said, well, you need to go to seminaries because in the seminaries, they'll teach you when to get loud in the sermon. There's men like that, okay? I'm so, there's a lot of men like that. See, this, this teaching here, this Bible study, is it Baptist? Is it Pentecostal? Is it Catholic? Methodist? Any of those religions? This is just the Word of God Bible study. That's all we want. Verse 2. That their hearts may be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. These are the things Paul wanted the Christians here to know. He, the Holy Spirit is, is the one who gives us strength, right? That's what he said. The Holy Spirit gives us strength. But we have to believe in our hearts. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength. But we got to believe it in our hearts that He does. I, people, I see a lot of defeated Christians. Why? Because they're not using the strength of the Holy Spirit that the Lord has put in them. They're not using it. It's there, but they're not using it. I see a lot of and I hate that. Because they have the power of God in them. But they're letting the devil kick them around. I see it. We need to quit doing that. And I'm, I, I pray to God that in this Bible study, that y'all will hear the Word of God. And that y'all will decide, that y'all would choose and say, Hey, mm-mm. the devil has no power over me. None. Do you hear me? Amen. The devil has no power over us. If he gets power over us, it's because we've allowed him to have it. We have given him the power to be over us. Christians, live who you are. Quit being a wimp. Quit being scared of the devil. Quit listening to his lies. Quit. Because you have a father who loves you, who gave his son for you. Give him all your love and attention and strength. Believe me, the devil doesn't want you to have that. He wants you to live a defeated life. He wants you to. And we allow him. God uses gifted men to teach like me he's got pastors he's got teachers now I say I have the gift I don't know if I got the gift I just know I like to teach okay now whether I have the gift or not I don't know but I know I love to teach so 
He's given us that in the church. There's pastors and teachers. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 14 tells us, A believing, a believing Christian, a, a Christian who believes everything that's in here, in this word of God, a Christian who believes that, believes it from his heart, you know what kind of walk they're going to have? A strong walk. They're going to have the walk that their light is going to shine out there in the darkness. People who believe in the word of God and live it. Christians try to have one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. What did the Lord say? If you're trying to ride the fence, he said he'd rather just spit you out of his mouth. That's what the Lord thinks of us who are trying to do both. He's saying, hey, choose me or choose them, period. That's it. There's no middle. There is no riding right the fence. We seem to try to do it that way, but there is not that way. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're riding the fence, the Lord wants to spit you out of his mouth. That's the word of God. I'm just telling you what the Lord said. United in love, what it says, which means to bring together. The Bible, the Living Bible translated by saying in Ephesians 4.16, which I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Who's the body? The church. Like right now, if everybody in here is a believer, then this is the body right here. This is the church right here. Not that building on the corner over there. That's just a building. It's just a building material stuff. That's all it is. There's nothing holy about the buildings. I don't care how big of a cross it's got. I don't care how many stained windows it has. It's just a building. The church is a group of believers. And if everybody in here is a believer, then this is the church right here. All right. He makes the whole body fit together as each part does its own special work. So everybody in here has a special work that the Lord has for you. If you're walking with the Lord, He has a special work for you. It might be prayer. Some of us in here might be prayer warriors. We're, he just put it on us. We pray. We're always praying. He might put it on, on some of us to be, uh, well, He puts it on all of us to minister out there. That's, that's all of us. But some of us have a little stronger desire than others. Okay, Some of us uh, use the strength of the Holy Spirit in us. Like I said before, we go out there in boldness. We don't go out there as scared and as wimps. What can I talk to you about the Lord? What? Can I talk? No. That's not what he said to do. Go out there. Preach the word of God. Don't be ashamed of it. We're in the right place. We are in the right place. Not them. We're in the right place. And the rest of the verse says, It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing in love. So this body right here, if we were all to do our special abilities that the Lord has given us, we would be helping each other to grow. And we would be a powerful church. Because we're believers here and we walk with the Lord. Amen? We're not going to let false doctrine come in here. Amen? Because I'm not. And this is not bragging. Believe me, this is not bragging. But I know the Word of God. I can talk to a guy right there at that door. And if he's coming with a false doctrine, I, I promise you, not because of me, but I've got the discernment. I will know if this is a false teacher. It doesn't mean I know everything, because I don't. But I've been living and studying the Word of God long enough where I can recognize a wolf. And there's wolves out there. They're out there. And then wolves, guess what? They look just like me. They look just like me. They carry the Bible. They teach the Word. But guess what? The Word they're teaching is what they think. What's their opinion? They're taking verses... Oh, this looks like a good verse. Not the book. They're taking verses and making a, a, a denomination out of it, out of a verse. We don't want that. We don't need men like that. And this is what this book is about. We're not in our, in our organization here. Remember what I told you about when uh, they put the church in a building? It used to be in the homes, but then the Romans, they put it in the building. Well, that's the worst thing that ever happened to the church because when it got into that building... It became an organization. It did no longer was it the church of God, an organization. I mean, we need churches that are filled with the Spirit, churches that are in homes, because the buildings are not working. How many lost people are in, are in churches on Sunday morning? 70%. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to say at least half the people who go to church are lost. I'm being nice. So, probably more than not, a lot of people talk about heaven and going. So, is that a church? 
Because the definition of a church, what did I tell you it was? Is a group of believers. Is that, is that church I go to? Is everybody saved in that church? So is that a church? It's just a gathering. Social gathering sometimes. Man, I better not let no pastors hear this teaching, huh? <laughs> but this is the truth, people. This is the truth. Our churches need to be churches. Group of believers. Now, I can be an evangelist because I can preach salvation. I can go out there and I can preach to lost people. I've been preaching to lost people for a long time. And I have no one teaching me but the Holy Spirit. It wasn't about, not this Baptist church, but the Baptist church I used to go to, they had a soul winning class. The pastor said, why aren't you going to this? I know you, you always like to talk about the Lord. How come you're not going to it? I told him. I said, because the Lord tells me what to say. He doesn't give me a step by step. The Lord gives me the words to say when I'm witnessing. Amen? Uh, by the way, those of you who know me, yeah, you know I'm not scared to talk to pastors. I'm going to tell them. Just like I went to that pastor and told him, hey, show them what they were spending the tithe money on. I said, there's three things the tithe money is supposed to be for. And we're not going to get into it. But I told him, there's three things the tithe money is for. Look at all what we're spending it on. I went straight to the pastor and showed it to him. He said, well, y'all put that on there. Which... He wasn't talking to me because I didn't put it on there. But the members of the church, they voted whether to support this or not with the tithe money. Okay? So he said the members put that on there. Well, you're the pastor. You tell them we're not using the tithe money for this. Because biblically, there's only three things that the tithe money is used for. And he should have he should have given them the whole counsel of God and showed them what the tithe money is for. Okay, I'm on 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Are our churches that way today? Is there divisions among the churches? Big time. What did the Lord say right here? I beg you, brethren, I beg you by the name of the Lord Jesus, that that y'all all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among the Christians. Are we failing? Yes, we are failing. Get the full richness from God's word. Get the full... This is nothing but rich. Every word in here. Every word. I told you the other day. The word A. The. All those... Even those little words. It. All those words are have a great meaning. The word D has a great meaning in here. God did not waste any words in this Bible. There's no words in this Bible, even down to the word A. There's no wasted words in here. Every word in here is from God and has a great meaning. We got to believe that. We got to believe when we read this Bible, we got to believe it's from God. And it wasn't just written. It was written by men, but the Bible says they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, God, what to write. Now, if we can't believe that, then we're all doomed. If we can't believe that, then what are we going to live by? Because if we don't believe this, the Word of God, the Bible, if we don't believe this, then what we're just going to go on what we think? Well, guess how many opinions you're going to have out there? If this was not the Word of God, then when we go before God on the Day of Judgment, He could not hold us accountable for anything because we didn't have the truth. But He did give us the truth. Amen. We know if we die tonight, we're going to be with the Lord. We don't hope it. We know that. How many of us know that? The Bible plainly says, as soon as you die, it says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. As soon as you take that last breath, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Did he say we were going to stay in the grave for a while? Is, they, uh, is, is Abraham and all them, Moses, are they still in the grave just waiting to be with the Lord? Mm -mm. Their, their shell of a body is there, the body that they were in. But their soul and spirit is already with the Lord. That's why I rejoice knowing that my five-year-old, when she went to be with the Lord, I know where she's at. It's been, let's see, she'd be 31. It's been 26 years since she's been gone. And I've been to the cemetery in 26 years. I've been to the cemetery maybe four times. She's not there. Her little body's there, her shell. But her soul and her spirit is in heaven. Amen? So why do I go to the cemetery? At the beginning of the teaching, I told y'all, we're going to get away from the way the world has been teaching us what to do and how to think. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. 
This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Do you understand what that's saying? This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. But he's talking about lost people here. We're Christians. We're not supposed to walk like them. In the vanity of their mind. If their mind. They're walking the way they think. They think this is right. Well I think if my good outweighs my bad. I'm going to heaven. That's vanity in their mind. Y'all hear me? Which is a lot more. I just used that as an example. Verse 18. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. These lost people, they're blinded. The Bible says they're ignorant. Now, if you go to Robert Schuller's church, Robert Schuller with the big glass cathedral, he's not gonna he's not gonna preach this to you. Why? Because they have nothing but positive thinking. He will not preach a negative this is negative. He would not preach this to you. Well, Jesse, you know, you shouldn't be pointing your finger. No, no. The man is not preaching the Word of God. The man is preaching the philosophy of positive thinking. And I will point them out. What did Jesus do to the religious leaders? He pointed them out. He pointed them and called them, you hypocrites, you vipers. Jesus pointed them out. Who's my teacher? Jesus. I'm telling y'all who the wolves are out there. I have no problem with that. But I got, I'm going to know that I know that I know that they are before I say it. Robert Schuller is preaching philosophy, philosophy of positive thinking. That's not Jesus. First Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of the godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of the angels, preached on the gen, unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, when it says in the world, right here, he's not talking about the lost people. Believed on in the world, meaning the disciples, the Christians, believed on him. Now, verse 3 of chapter 2. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Right here, the Lord says, we can have all the treasures of knowledge right here. It's right here. Here's my word. You can know it right now. I'm not hiding anything from you. Seduction of Christianity. The book, it talks about all this stuff creeping into the church. Even now, the churches, we have the philosophy of men, philosophy of men that are, that's taken over the church. I pray to God that I, all, that I will always give you the Word, God's Word only, period. That's it. Verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Christian parents, those of us who have kids and those of us who are young and might have kids, make sure your child is grounded in the Word of God before you send them off to school. Husband, fathers, that's our responsibility. Make sure that your child is grounded in the Word of God before you send them to school. Because in school, they're going to teach them that, this, that the world's been here for millions of years. The Bible says it's been here about 6,000 years. They're going to teach them evolution. That we came from apes or whatever. Teach your child. Teach your child before you send them to school who God is. And what we believe. Fathers. Especially fathers. I'm especially talking to the fathers. Because we're, we are the head of the house. And it's our responsibility on what our wife and our children know. It's our responsibility. So teach them before they go into the world where they're taught nothing but trash. It's trash. Also we Christians better read and understand the word of God those of us that are in here because if we don't we will be fooled by these wolves that are out there we will be fooled by their philosophy because they believe me it makes a lot of sense to them and to us it will make a lot of sense to us if we don't know what's in here we need, we need to know what's in here and y'all being here tonight praise God that's just one little, little more of an inch you're getting closer to not being fooled by the wolves out there. And remember, when I say wolves, I'm not talking about people who look, yeah, you know. I'm talking about men who might wear suits or a nice dress, who are well cut, look like preachers, 
These are the men that are, that are wolves that I'm talking about. If we could just recognize them by looking at them, oh man, it would be easy on us. Oh, look at him, he's got horns. I know that's a wolf. But it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Because their craftiness, they know, like the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, they already know what we're going to tell them. They're taught, well, you know, those Baptists, those Pentecostals, those religious people, they're going to tell you this and they're going to tell you this. And this is what you tell them. So before they send them out, the Mormons on the bikes, the Jehovah Witnesses door to door, before they send them out, they already taught on what verses we're going to use to show them that they're wrong. So they're, they're crafty. They're very crafty. What did I say the other night? The Lord says, if anybody comes to that door with another gospel, not to let him in your house. Verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, join and beholding your order in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Paul saying, I know that I'm not with you, but I am in the spirit. That's what Paul is saying. And he's rejoicing knowing that you're going to follow, that you're not going to follow the garbage of the world. Because this is what Paul is doing. He's doing what I'm doing right now. He's feeding. He's trying to educate his brothers and sisters that they won't fall to this garbage of the world, the, the, the trash that's out there. But he says he wants us to be strong in our faith. We need to be strong in what we're being taught. Ever since y'all been coming to this Bible study, y'all need to hang on to it. Y'all need to hang on to it and live by it. Because the Lord, this is what the Lord wants. Because if you do, if you do, you won't be fooled by these cults or wolves or the philosophy of men. Of men. And this book of Colossians, it, that's, it, that's why I'm teaching it. Because it talks all about the world stuff. And for those of y'all who weren't here, my first Wednesday night, I didn't even get to verse 1. My first Wednesday night. Because all I talked about was how the Lord wants us to be separated from the world. Verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Well, I mean, is that pretty? Yes, pretty much. I mean, do I have to say anything? As ye have therefore received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk ye in Him. How did you receive the Lord? By faith, right? Did you see Him? No. You're going by faith that there is a God. All right? The same faith that you use in believing that there is a God, use that same faith on everything else He says on here. If He says, hey, Christians, don't worry about tomorrow, don't worry about tomorrow. If you believe Him and you have faith that He's saving your soul from hell, if you can believe that, then what makes it hard to believe that He's got tomorrow? How many, people, how many Christians, they can't do it? They worry about tomorrow. They do. And the Lord, Bible, the Lord says, don't worry about tomorrow. If you got your eyes on me, I've got tomorrow already planned out for you. Amen? Amen. He does. He does. He, you keep your eyes on Him, and this is a guarantee because it comes from the Bible. When it comes from the Bible, I'll guarantee it. This is a guarantee to you. If you keep your eyes on the Lord, He's got tomorrow. You don't have to worry about it. 1 John 2.6 He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. And who's he? Jesus. So he's saying right here, we, if we say we're in him and he's in us, then we need to walk like Jesus walked. That's why we're called Christians, remember? Christians means we're Christ-like, Remember? So if you're, going to, if you're going to take the title on as Christian, then you better walk it. We better walk it. Because we've got enough Christians out there who are not walking it and making the rest of us look, you know. But look at him. He, he proclaims to be a Christian, but look what he's doing or saying or whatever. So if you're going to take the title on, it's a very serious title to take. Because you're saying, I am Christ-like. And you're out there screwing around. And you're saying, I'm Christ-like. God said, I want 100%. He didn't say, give me 95%, 50%. He said, I want 100 Unless you can give God 100% of your heart, soul, and mind, you can't be His disciple. You can't. So Christians, if you give Him 100% of your heart, soul, and mind, then your light's going to shine. Okay? You will be Christ-like. What happened to Peter when he was walking to the Lord on the water? 
Jesus said, come, walk on the water. Jesus said, come. He got off the boat. He started walking. But then what happened? He started looking at the waves. He started looking at the seas. He started looking at the storms in his life. Y'all hear me? He started looking at the storms in his life instead of the Lord. And he sank. That's a great teaching there in and by itself. That's why we have the Word of God. He teaches us. Okay, look, if you take your eyes off of me, you're going to be a Peter. You're going to sink. Galatians 3.3 3. Are ye so foolish, having begun in spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Now what this is talking about is we get saved. We get saved in the church. You know, just accept Jesus as the Lord. You know, just accept Jesus in your heart and you can be born again. But then we say okay. But then right after that, then they put this stuff on us. Well, you, you know, now that you're a Christian, you need to, and you need to, you know, if we're saved by grace, by our faith in the Lord, he's saying, are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by being in the flesh, doing the things of man? This is what this whole book is about, following men. This, this whole book, that's why I like it. That's why I'm teaching it. This book teaches you, follow Jesus or follow man.